Today we're going to um, be talking about aspects of peripheral tolerance and autoimmunity. And I always find today's class period kind of funny. And the reason why I say that is that if you ask me and how I think about this material, I think about this material as being kind of really our last uh, set of material before we go into the clinical information. And so I think of today as our last um, sort of basic immunology day before we go into clinical stuff. And in general, when I, um, if I were to ask students, most students think today is the first day of clinical. <laughs> so whether we call today a clinical day or a non-clinical day is perhaps a matter of uh, opinion. Um, in any case, we are going to be talking about um, autoimmunity and self-tolerance both today and Monday. This set of slides that is posted is meant for both days. There are some slides at the very end of this that I may or may not get to on Monday. Uh, I feel like every year I have to shove them in somewhere. And so this is, this is the first possible place. And if I don't have time, I'll move them to the second possible place. And if that doesn't work, I'll put them in the third possible place. Um, in any case, uh, if we think about autoimmunity, which is kind of where we're going here, uh, autoimmunity results from some sort of failure of tolerance mechanisms. I will also tell you that as we are going forward with a few different clinical types of immunology uh, things, I will talk about autoimmunity. I will also at some point talk about hypersensitivity. Um, and um, in the field, there is also something known as an auto-inflammatory disease. I think that oftentimes people will lump those together um, if they are not uh, immunologists. So just so you are aware, when I as an immunologist say autoimmunity, I am thinking of you making an adaptive response to a self protein. Um, so hypersensitivity, which we'll talk about later, is you making a response to a foreign harmless protein, for example, pollen, um, and it's an adaptive response. An auto-inflammatory response is you making a wrong innate response. So I will tell you that, there, that this is one of those things where sometimes people will have things bleed together, and I do have them in a very specific boxes in my brain. So I could imagine if you may have some questions and I'd be like, well, technically we're in, yeah, it's not today's box. Um, so know that um, there is all of that. Um, though they are all kind of have in common that they are your immune system doing too much. Immunodeficiency is your immune system doing too little. Um, so remember Goldilocks being so important in immunology. So these autoimmune diseases, are all uh, resulting from some kind of failure of self-tolerance, some reason why we are not tolerating self-antigens. Very often, that may include a piece that is related to genetic susceptibility, as well as some other things that are influencing tolerance. That can include um, some environmental issues or things like that, as well as some genetic issues. And that together will influence what's going on with tolerance. We've talked a little bit about tolerance earlier this semester. I've already told you about one type of tolerance, which is central tolerance. Central tolerance means a tolerance mechanism that happens to an adaptive immune cell while that adaptive immune cell is developing. So we're talking about mechanisms that allow for tolerance during B cell development or during T cell development.
This is the information that we talked about earlier this semester about B cell central tolerance. So remember that if we have a B cell that is responsive to a self antigen, that B cell has three different options to allow for um, it to become tolerant. One is a uh, or one that leads to central tolerance. One, we can have deletion of that B cell, so we get rid of that self-reactive B cell. One, we receptor edit, so we make a new light chain um, so that our B cell is no longer self-reactive. Or we will um, energize that B cell, um, so we have an energic B cell in the periphery, and that B cell is no longer going to be making responses. It's no longer active. If you recall, when we talked about B cell development, we saw one place, or we, we came up with one piece of this that was a little bit of a problem that sort of let us see a, a way that a self-reactive B cell could sort of slip through this process. Um, so what was the issue in the B cell development um, process where there was sort of a place where self-reactive B cells could still make it through. They could sort of slip through the cracks, although it's kind of a big crack. Um, what, what's the problem that we talked about with the B cell central tolerance mechanism? Yeah, Sebastian. Exactly. So this process um, is limited to antigens that are present in the bone marrow for testing those developing B cells. And those, uh, and so basically we can test and we can uh, get tolerant B cells, it's often referred to as tolerizing. We can tolerize our B cells to anything that's in the bone marrow, but all the rest of the antigens in the body we're out of luck on with this. And so you can see that there's a uh, easy way that there can be some autoreactive B cells that are, are generated and that make it out into the periphery. There's one other place where B cell biology um, can potentially lead to some autoreactive B cells in the periphery. If you recall, we talked about the somatic hypermutation process where our B cell, when it gets activated, will then um, acquire some mutations so we can change the affinity of that B cell's antibody, um, ideally for the same antigen that it bound to. But it is possible that as we are making these mutations and changing the antibody or the B cell receptor protein, we may suddenly turn a B cell that used to react to foreign stuff into a self-reactive B cell by changing that receptor. And so we can also see autoreactive B cells get generated in a germinal center. And so what you can notice is that we got some flaws in this B cell plan where there can be some autoreactive B cells. We also talked about the central tolerance process in the thymus. Um, where we looked at how we dealt with uh, tolerance during T cell development. And if you remember, um, our T cells that had very high affinity for antigen in the thymus uh, also underwent uh, deletion or negative selection um, so that we got rid of them. Um, and some of them that had kind of a high intermediate affinity um, were induced to become Tregs. And so both of those things were going to be really helpful for central tolerance in the thymus. Um, and this is particularly uh, great because our medullary thymic epithelial cells express all of those tissue-specific uh, antigens. So with the, the B cells in the bone marrow, we have this problem of all the antigens aren't there. In the thymus, life is good because all the antigens are there. So we get to test T cells against every single possible antigen, self antigen anyway. So that's good. Yay. But we have an issue still with T cell development. It's a different issue 
that could potentially lead to self-reactivity, um, and but it is still an issue. So what was our problem with um, the central tolerance process in the thymus? Yeah, Rishi. So they're sort of not, yeah, not exactly. But when I, what I actually really like about what you said um, is that you said escape. And on a past year, I like wrote a question about a cell that escaped the thymus. And students didn't know that I meant that like it wasn't supposed to leave. And I'm like, that's what the word escape means. Um, so good job using the word escape correctly. I like it. Erin. <laughs> Exactly. The only the antigens that are present in the thymus are all self antigens, and all of our T cells, in order to be positively selected and to leave the thymus, have to have this sort of very low affinity for self antigen. So every T cell has to be kind of lowly self reactive, have a little bit of self reactivity. So again, there's a there's a place here where you can see things are not going to be perfect. There are situations where patients have defects in central tolerance. I told you about one of those situations when I told you about T cell development. One of those situations is um, seen in patients with this disease, APESED. In APESED, patients are missing air. You can see there's air with a X through it. Um, so they don't make air. That means that in the thymus, they don't make all those tissue-specific antigens. So now there are antigens that are not present to allow for um, tolerance in the thymus. And so now we have a whole lot of um, cells that should have been negatively selected that make it out of the thymus. They escape. Um, in each person, the cells that escape will be a little different. And so the specific organs that are targeted in each person will be a little bit different in these patients. So you can see some of them will have um, thyroid issues, some will have adrenal failure, um, some will have uh, issues with their reproductive organs, some will have diabetes. Um, many of them have uh, this uh, issue with their uh, fingernails. So it's this weird combination. And so the idea that I want you to get here is that if a person has a defect in central tolerance, they are probably going to have systemic autoimmunity. They are going to have autoimmunity of many types against many body systems because they're going to have issues with a lot of different cells. It's not going to be you know one unlucky cell that makes it through the tolerance process, it's probably going to be a lot, and they're going to have a lot of problems going on. There is also another famous example of um, the uh, defect in central tolerance leading to systemic autoimmunity. Um, this disease is known as IPEX. And so you can see IPEX listed up at the top. Um, IPEX stands for Immune Polyendocrinopathy um, Enteropathy X-Link Syndrome. And IPEX is uh, caused by a, a mutation in FOXP3. So in IPEX, the IPEX patients do not have FOXP3. So what, what's FOXP3 important for? What's FOXP3 to? Yeah, Rishi. Tregs. That's the transcription factor need to, needed to make Tregs. So these patients have no Tregs which means that they don't have any T cells that can turn off other cells. Um, so these patients are going to not actually have the ability to have Tregs. They have no Tregs in their body. And they will have many types of autoimmune reactions because they don't have any of those off kinds of T cells. Um, this is usually in boys, um, as FOXP3 is on the X chromosome. It's an X-linked uh, disease. And what you can see is that um, the IPEX uh, children will have um, autoimmune enteropathy. That means they have GI problems. 
eczema or other dermatitis, so a skin issue, um, the nail dystrophy again, autoimmune endocrinopathies, so that means they're having autoimmune attacks of um, endocrine glands, uh, autoimmune skin conditions like alopecia or pemphigoid. Pemphigoid is so gross. Um, enlargement of the secondary lymphoid organs, insulin-dependent diabetes, food allergies, and infections, and most of them will die in the first two years of life. Um, so again, you can see that there are multiple different um, body systems that are being impacted. These, are, these patients who don't have a, a central tolerance going correctly don't have one autoimmune disease. They have many autoimmune diseases all together. Yeah? So in pemphigoid, you have antibodies that they're autoantibodies, and they specifically attack um, a protein that is found in your skin. It's actually the protein that makes junctions in your skin. It's the protein that holds skin cells together. So if you have antibodies attacking that, your skin cells can't hold together very well, and your skin breaks open. Um, and you have really disgusting looking skin breaks. Um, so I usually think of it actually phrased differently. I usually think of it phrased like this. Uh, which is pemphigus vulgaris. Um, don't Google it unless you have a strong stomach. Um, and I'm, I assume that I will see the facial expressions of the people who are going to Google it. <laughs> All right, so um, this is kind of what goes on with central tolerance. This information, this slide, gives us some information about some common autoimmune diseases. The thing that I want you to see on this slide, on this table, is the column on the far right, which is the frequency of some of these autoimmune diseases. We can talk about the specifics of some of these diseases as we go forward, but right now I want to look at the frequencies. So you can see that um, psoriasis, which is particularly uh, frequent, is present in 1 in 50 individuals. Um, type 1 diabetes, 1 in 800. And as you look at these autoimmune diseases and their frequencies, based on what I've told you right now, you might find those frequencies surprising. Because what you might realize is all of the holes in B cell and T cell development. We easily identified holes in both B cells and T cell development. And yet, these autoimmune diseases are perhaps more rare than you would expect based on how obvious those holes are, right? And so what that should tell you is that there's something besides central tolerance going on. And happily, that is true. There's this whole other layer of tolerance that does not apply to B cells and T cells when they are in developmental organs like the thymus and the bone marrow. These are types of tolerance mechanisms that apply to those B cells and T cells when they're in the periphery. Um, and they are known as peripheral tolerance. And so this is sort of this nice overlapping layer that also protects us from uh, self-reactivity um, as an additional layer. And so today, we're going to be talking through the specific mechanisms of self-tolerance, um, specifically peripheral tolerance. And so here you can see a lovely slide. Um, that peripheral tolerance is acting in addition to central tolerance. So central tolerance is uh, how we deal with self-reactive cells um, in the organs where we are developing our lymphocytes. Peripheral tolerance is how we deal with self-reactive lymphocytes in the peripheral tissues. When I first started TAing immunology, oh, so many years ago, 
the person who uh, I was teeing for had a really specific way he thought about this peripheral tolerance stuff. And so the way he thought about it was that there were six mechanisms. And so in my head, it's there are six mechanisms. And so we're going to go through those six mechanisms. For each of them, we're going to think about how they get set up, but also we're going to think about how they could get broken. How could they get messed up in some way? I've been teaching this myself for a bunch of years now. I still feel funny because I teach them in a different order than the other person did. But we're going to go with this order because I think it makes sense. And the reason why I think it makes sense is because um, this order allows us to think about some similarities in how we break some of these. OK? So the first one is perhaps one that might be kind of obvious to you. Um, if you were in charge of the world, and you were going to design a peripheral tolerance mechanism, what is one way you might try to make sure that you didn't have something responding to self-antigen? What would be sort of the easiest, most straightforward thing to do? If there was a cell that was self-reactive, how are you going to make sure it doesn't do its thing? What? Kill. You're going to kill it. You saw that in central tolerance, we have this option of deletion. In peripheral tolerance, we also see deletion as one of the six mechanisms. And so the first of our mechanisms is clonal deletion. And so with clonal deletion, um, sometimes we will have cells that are self-reactive that will undergo apoptosis when they are triggered in the periphery. Some of the details of how this works are a little wonky. Because somehow this cell knows I'm getting a strong signal from a self-antigen instead of, I'm getting a strong signal from a foreign antigen. And if you think about that on kind of a cell biology biochemistry level, how the heck does a cell know it's getting a self versus foreign antigen? We, it just knows it's getting a strong signal. As we learn more about clonal deletion, right now what we think is it is somewhat related to clonal exhaustion. If a cell is responding to a self antigen, it's responding to it every day for years, for your whole life. And so if it keeps responding and responding and responding and responding and responding and it never gets a chance to go to sleep, feels like me, um, then it might end up undergoing apoptosis. And so clonal deletion might be kind of an extension of exhaustion. OK? So this one's a pretty easy, straightforward mechanism of peripheral tolerance. The next one is somewhat related. Um, it's also one that actually you secretly know about, but you don't know that you know. And it is related to something that you learned about B cells when we talked about B cell biology. So remember that for a B cell to make a very strong antibody response, with a high level of antibodies, um, class switched antibodies, antibodies of high affinity, all that good stuff. That B cell requires T cell help. So the B cell, if it doesn't have T cell help, the B cell is just going to kind of hang out and be like, hello, I'm ready to be activated. But if there's no T cell, the B cell can't be activated. One of the ways that we can have 
peripheral tolerance. And this is particularly peripheral tolerance of B cells. We see this most often with B cells. It's through a process known as clonal helplessness. And so we can have a situation where the B cell might make it into the periphery, but the T cell that responds to the same antigen, which could give the help, doesn't make it to the periphery. In which case the B cell just hangs out and can't do anything because it doesn't have T cell help. So you could imagine a B cell that is responding to a self-antigen. And it's responding to a self-antigen that's not present in the bone marrow. It's going to make it out of the bone marrow because its antigen wasn't there. But remember, T cells are seeing all the antigens in the thymus. So the T cell could get deleted because all the antigens are in the thymus, even though the B cell can't get deleted because its antigen is, is missing. When that B cell gets out into the periphery, it's not going to find its matching T cell in order to get help. And so that B cell is going to uh, not be able to make a lot of antibodies, antibodies with high affinity, all that good stuff, because that B cell is going to be helpless. Um, and so clonal helplessness is the second of our uh, mechanisms of tolerance. I do these two first because of one really big thing that they have in common. So let's imagine ways that you could break deletion or that you could break helplessness. If you get in a situation where you have a cell, it's autoreactive, and you delete it, is it possible to undelete it? No, you are not going to bring your cell back from the dead, right? When the cell is dead, the cell is dead. Both of these involve a cell dying. And so in both cases, you can't really break them. You could have them not happen in the first place, but you can't like turn them back. All of the other ones have a way they can kind of get turned back. These you can't, because a cell died, and you're not bringing it back to life. And so that's why I put these two together. The next two also have some things in common. Um, when I think of these two, one of them I think is pretty straightforward. The other one, I think, is one that people, like, at least I used to find really confusing. Um, then I actually learned some real life examples of it, and I was like, oh, that's all. That's all it was. You made it sound so much more complicated. So there are going to be some examples, and hopefully the examples help you get what's going on there. OK? So the, the next mechanism, the, the uh, third mechanism, is clonal suppression. Um, clonal suppression is really just a fancy way of saying you make some T-regs. So we can have T-regs made in the thymus or we can have T-regs made in the peripheral tissue because of the cytokines that our naive T cell uh, experiences when it's getting activated. In either case, we're going to make regulatory T cells that express the transcription factor FOXP3. And those, transcription fac and those cells with that transcription factor can inhibit other cells. And so one way that these autoreactive cells, these red autoreactive cells, um, can be limited, can make sure they don't respond to self-antigen, is that Tregs can come and shut them off. So we can have clonal suppression.
The fourth mechanism is called coronal deviation. And this is the one that sometimes confuses people a little bit. Yep? Um, do T-Rex turn off No, T-Rex can turn off all sorts of cells. So they can turn off B cells. They can actually, there's some data about them turning off macrophages. They, you can kind of imagine they can turn off all the cells. <laughs> okay? Um, so our fourth mechanism is called colonial deviation. And this is the one where, at least to me, examples really help. So here you are able to see a response that is happening to, um, and so up here is this T cell that is making the response. And that T cell is actually responding to um, antigens from a type of microbe called a helminth. Um, and a helminth is a parasitic worm. You'll see some pictures of helminths on the later slide. And that T cell, when it reacts with the um, helminth antigen, can differentiate in different ways towards different types of T cell subsets. One option, which is shown in these four boxes on the left, is that the T cell could become a Th2 cell. Alternatively, the cell could become a Th1 cell. And, it, and some of that is related to um, some details regarding the helminth. Some of it actually is related to things like genetic predisposition. There are some people who are genetically predisposed to make TH2s more often or to make TH1s more often. I'm a TH2 person. I make TH2s to everything. If the T cell happens to make a TH2 response, then we're going to get things like changes in uh, epithelial cells. You're going to get some mucus production. That's going to help try to flush the worms out of the body. We're going to turn on eosinophils. That's going to kill the worms. We're going to make IgE. That's going to help kill the worms. We're going to turn on mast cells. That's going to kill the worms. It's also going to give you diarrhea. That's going to help get all the worms out of your body. And all of those things are going to be protective. They're going to help you feel well. However, if that T cell be, uh, makes a Th1 response, we're going to activate macrophages instead. And the interferon gamma that those macrophages make is actually going to help the parasite, not help you. Interferon gamma is good for the parasite. And in fact, you're going to get further disruption of your tissue that you had. The parasite's trying to like break tissue barriers, and the interferon's going to help it. And you might make IgE antibodies that are useless. And in the end, you're going to feel terrible, and you're going to have host damage. And so what you should get here is that different types of helper T cell responses can either lead to a good response that protects you and helps you feel healthy, or a response that is damaging. Clonal deviation is a situation where we bias a response towards the kind that makes a helpful, protective response instead of one that makes a damaging response. So this T cell, you can sort of imagine, is getting deviated towards Th2 so that it doesn't hurt you instead of getting pushed towards Th1. Um, this is one example of that. Here is another example. This is in mice. And we're looking at mice who either make T-bet. Where have you heard of T-bet before? What's T-bet? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, it's the transcription factor for TH1s. Or we have mice that don't 
have TBAT. So these mice can't make Th1s. If you can't make a Th1, you make too much Th2. Remember how they kind of inhibit each other. If you look at the lungs of a mouse that has TBAT, they look like lungs. Notice this open space in the lungs. That's where the air goes. If a mouse doesn't have TBAT, it's not going to be able to make a Th1 response. It's going to make a lot of Th2 responses. And when that happens, we start to have eosinophils that will end up coming into the lungs because those eosinophils are activated by a Th2 response. We're actually going to have some wound on the airway, so you're actually going to get this different kind of wall as you're trying to repair it. And eventually, this area is going to get full of mucus, and it's going to look like that. And if you look in the wall, it's going to be full of lymphocytes and eosinophils that are coming in. If you notice, um, this actually is much harder to move. That's much less elastic. It's basically stiff, unlike this other airway. So we've got a stiff airway that's full of cells and full of mucus. You can't breathe through that. Look right there. There's no place for the air to go. This is asthma. Um, and so in this case, if our mouse makes a Th2 response, instead of making a Th1 response, our mouse is going to be predisposed to having asthma, as opposed to if it made a Th1 response, it would live happily ever mouse after. And so again, this could be related to genetics. This is a very obvious genetic example. Um, or it could be related to some other factors that we'll get into that push the response towards one versus the other T cell subset. Yeah, Krishna. Exactly. So in different situations, it could be protect any of them could be protective or pathogenic. Okay. And so the example I gave you before, in that example, TH2 was good. In this example, TH2 is bad. Okay. And so it in every case there's one that's good and one that's bad. And this also you can extend it when you get to TH17s and things like that. There's one that's good and some that are bad. Okay. And so the idea is we push the T cells towards the good kind for deviation and away from the bad kinds. So that even if we're getting kind of a self resp response, it's not the kind that's going to cause damage. And just sort of one other piece to this example, um, here we are looking at infection of a mouse. Uh, specifically, this is a Balb C mouse with a parasite called Leishmania major. Um, Balb C mice are known to predominantly make Th2 responses. The, for whatever reason, Balb C mice make Th2s whenever you give them stuff. They're pushed, they're, their immune system, their genetics always goes towards Th2. If you give Balb C mouse this parasite, Leishmania major, in yellow, they all die by 70 days. Sad for them. If, however, you give that mouse antibodies against IL-4 at the same time, and in this case we're using antibodies that block IL-4, so we make it so we don't get an IL-4 response here, we stop the Th2 response in this case, the mice all live happily ever after. And so again, this is showing you that these responses can be detrimental in some cases, and just by shifting, we're deviating the response. Here we've deviated by adding uh, anti-IL-4 and getting rid of the TH2 response. Now everything is working way better. Um, and so I put these two um, types of responses together because really, Clonal suppression and clonal deviation are kind of about what kind of T cell, CD4 T cell do you have? What kind of helper T cell subsets do you have? Because it, it's really just about which way are the, t the helper T cells pushed. Are they pushed towards Tregs? Are they pushed towards something protective? 
or are they pushed towards something pathogenic? So that's why I often think about these two kind of as being somewhat similar. Um, there are lots of applications of this. I actually had usually give uh, do these next few, some of these slides that are upcoming in a uh, different lecture. I took them out this year and moved them to this spot, so we're going to see if this spot works for them. Um, so one of the things that we can think a little bit about is whether we actually can push an immune response around in terms of changing what type of helper T cells that we have. Um, and it turns out that we do know some ways of doing that. One of them was actually involved, one of these types of experiments was involved in how we started to understand regulatory T cells. There's a way, it turns out, you can push the immune system towards re making regulatory T cells. And this has so many important implications. Um, and so you can, in fact, induce regulatory T cells um, based on how, and when I say how, I mean in what anatomic location um, you experience the antigen the first time. So um, this is refer referred to as something called oral tolerance. And so the big picture idea here is if you first experience an antigen um, by ingesting it in the mouth, you end up pushing tolerance to that antigen. And so here, first we're going to actually look, I'm going to look, go through this in a slightly weird way for the experiment. So let's imagine first we've got a mouse, and we give this mouse some antigen called ovalbumin. It's a chicken antigen. Mice should make a response to a chicken antigen because mice are not chickens. And beforehand, the mouse were fed mouse food, which is the control. Then the mouse makes a really good response to ovalbumin. All of that's everything going as it should. If, however, you feed the mouse some ovalbumin first, so the first time the mouse's body experiences ovalbumin is uh, orally, and you then do the exact same procedure where you inject that ovalbumin to the mouse, the mouse no longer responds to ovalbumin. It doesn't make a response to ovalbumin. And if you, we look, we actually see that we have a whole lot of regulatory T cells that respond to ovalbumin. And so it seems as though there is actually an active downregulation of responses um, when we encounter antigens in the GI tract. Um, partially because of the types of macrophages and dendritic cells there, they really push T cells that come by to turn into regulatory T cells. Um, why does it make sense evolutionarily for this to happen? Yeah, Sebastian. Exactly. You need to be able to eat. You are eating things that are foreign. You need to be able to eat. And so you, you don't want to be turning on all sorts of immune responses in your GI tract to all these foreign antigens. And so your GI tract is sort of biased towards making a regulatory T cell response. Obviously, there are lots of questions here about food allergies and some of the details about food allergies. I'm only going to mention one um, sort of emerging story that people have. There are lots of questions people sometimes ask here about food allergies that I cannot answer, that we don't have answers to. But there's one thing that sort of that I find really interesting. Um, as you may be aware, there are dramatic increases in the number of peanut allergies in kids. So you didn't used to see a lot of kids with peanut allergies. Now there are way more kids who have peanut allergies. What we currently hypothesize is going on here is that in the past, kids first 
encountered peanut antigens by eating them, right? The first time you ever had a peanut antigen was because you ate peanut butter or something when you were a baby. And so you, any T cell that responded to peanut antigen was hit with a regulatory T cell, was tolerized, you turned it off, no more responses. However, now there are increasing numbers of lotions that have peanut antigens in them, specifically different types of peanut oils. And so more and more often, Babies are first responding to peanut allergens or peanut antigen and the skin before they actually eat it. And so now their first response is the inflammatory turning on a response to a foreign thing and not the response to ingestion. And so there does seem to actually be um, some correlations there that uh, hold up on that being at least related to what's going on. And that, that at least fits nicely in with what we're talking about here. And again, we can talk a little bit more about this stuff with when we talk about allergy. Um, but I also will tell you here and will tell you so many times throughout the rest, throughout the clinical section of this uh, semester that I am not an MD. And I am also not your MD. Um, so when you want to start asking me questions about like, well, what's going on with me being on XYZ medication? I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer for you. So for some reason, it's the allergy lecture. Everyone wants to know about their allergies, and I can't tell you about your allergies necessarily. So just FYI, I may not be able to answer all the questions. Yes? So what we think is going on is that the macrophages and dendritic cells that live in the GI tract push T cells towards um, being regulatory T cells. So those macrophages and dendritic cells are more likely to make things like TGF beta and IL-10 so that if there's a T cell that's around, those T cells get pushed into being a regulatory T cell. That one I know the answer to. Um, and so we can sort of think about Deviation and suppression all kind of get broken in very similar ways because they're all really about this balance between all of these helper T cell subsets. This phenomenon also leads to some other um, types of data. And so the data that I'm going to show you on the next few slides is uh, data that um, Various lay people have, they've like heard like three steps down the line. They don't actually know exactly where it came from, but they have these interpretations of how your immune system works because of this phenomenon. So I'm gonna tell you the actual phenomenon and what the data actually say on this one. Um, and it is related again to our Helminth infection and TH2 and TH1 responses. I've already gone through this exact example of the difference between Th1 and Th2 responses in Helminth infections. Remember that Th2 responses are really good in the case of a Helminth infection. Th1 responses are pretty bad in the case of a Helminth infection. So if you are infected with a Helminth, you want to make a Th2 response. OK, fine. Um, here are um, some actual diseases that are caused by Helminths. Um, so this includes um, infections with roundworms, flukes, and tapeworms, or nematodes, trematodes, and cestodes. Um, so this could be having a tapeworm. This could be having schistosomiasis, um, which is the example immunologists use for a lot of this. Um, this can involve hookworm. This can involve guinea worm. This can involve elephantiasis. Um, I saw a picture of that in my first year uh, freshman bio book, and I've been scared of it ever since. Um, this involves river blindness, um, trichinella. Um, one thing that's important here is uh, draculoniasis, um, which is guinea worm disease, um, was, uh, is, has been largely cured as a result of a medication made by Dr. William Campbell, who worked in RISE and won the Nobel Prize. So this is actually the RISE Nobel Prize <laughs> uh, disease, where the drug is from. In any cases, these are some of the big helminth uh, infectious diseases. 
want you to look at this list of infectious diseases and think for a second. Have you ever spent much time in your life being worried about having any of these? Have you ever wondered, oh my gosh, do I have one of these? They seem like a big problem in your life. Not really. And in fact, um, so I guess before we get to that, let me just show you um, a couple of details of what happens with the helminth with helmet uh, immune responses. So this little wormy thing, that's a schistosome larva. It's not even a full schistosome, that's the larva. All these little things around it that have E, those are eosinophils. What I want you to notice here is that there is no way that we are phagocytosing that larva nor any other further life cycle stage of this schistosome. And so instead, the only way we can really do anything about that schistosome, and this is true of any of these parasitic worms, is by using mast cells and eosinophils and having them release their granules at that little worm to try to basically throw toxic bombs at it to kill it. And so, our mast cell usually looks like this. It's full of all of these granules. If that mast cell gets degranulated, you can see that it loses all of those granules. And that's all basically happening where we're taking those granule contents and we are releasing them at the worm, which is too big for us to eat. And we're basically throwing toxic stuff at it, trying to kill it. And this is kind of what our immune system's got in a lot of ways. So this is sort of showing you again why the TH2 response is so important because it's going to help us with the mast cells and the eosinophils. Um, so all of this comes together with this. And this is um, some epidemiological data as are some of the pieces of data that I will show you on the next few slides that come up with all of this. If you look at the... Ooh, if you look at the map on the right, you can see different parts of the world um, colored based on how um, frequently people get helminth infections. And so places in the world where they're, that are in red uh, are places where there are a lot of helminth infections. Uh, South Africa and South Korea are moderate, I guess. Um, and you can see that we also see places where there are low helminth infections. So I asked you before if you were ever really worried about getting a helminth infection. May, not, may likely not have. And people have observed that if you look at where uh, individuals have autoimmune diseases, where people either frequently or non-frequently have autoimmune diseases, we, you mostly see autoimmune diseases in the countries that are shown in red. Um, you see much less. Uh, in the countries that are shown in blue. And if you look at these data, you notice that there seems to be an inverse correlation. That if your people in your area are infected with helminths a lot, they don't seem to get autoimmune diseases. And if people seem to get uh, to not be infected with helminths, they seem to get autoimmune diseases. And so this kind of started to lead people to ask questions about this and led to this hypothesis known as the hygiene hypothesis. So if you've ever heard about like your immune system needs germs and things, it's all coming from the hygiene hypothesis, though people are taking it in wacky directions sometimes. And so with the hygiene hypothesis, there have been additional observations that are made. Those observations are shown here. Notice that all of these observations are epidemiological observations. So we're looking at incidence of disease in populations. We don't necessarily have the total mechanism here. I'm going to hypothesize what immunologists hypothesize the mechanism to be, but know that this is observational. So we note that in developing countries, we see fewer people with allergies and autoimmune diseases, whereas in more westernized countries, we see more people with allergy and autoimmune disease. 
Um, we also, in uh, families that have more members, so large family size is associated with less allergies. Um, growing up in a rural home or growing up around livestock is associated with less allergy and auto um, as well as poor sanitation. And you can see that um, small family size, um, kind of the affluent urban homes, um, as well as good sanitation seem to be um, linked with uh, having um, autoimmune diseases or allergies. And so this um, is sometimes sort of hypothesized in this, this idea that perhaps in these situations where your immune system is not seeing helminths, is not seeing the right microbes, um, the immune system is held back, um, it gets poorly educated, exercised, and inexperienced, and it starts fighting imaginary infections. Uh, I think of it a little bit differently than that. The way that I think about it oftentimes is that Th1 and Th2 responses are in balance with one another. They are, you know, each inhibiting the other. They're e interacting, right? By and large, in our lives, we have gotten rid of the Th2 pathogens. And we mostly only see Th1 pathogens. And as a result, we've flipped that balance, or we've, we've distorted that balance. And that distorted balance is sort of resulting in our immune system going a little wacky. So this whole idea is largely about Helminth infection and having Th2 um, pathogens go away. Again, sometimes people take this and mean like, I shouldn't wear a mask because my immune system is not going to see enough microbes and my immune system is going to be weak. FYI, just from being alive in the world, your immune system sees hundreds or thousands of antigens every day. You have no shortage of them. Um, I will say that when I was in graduate school and any of us had allergies, we would laugh at each other and be like, your mom didn't let you eat enough dirt as a kid. Um, but um, in general, this is really, you know, sometimes when people are like, oh no, I must be around, um, I must make sure I'm with microbes, being clean is, I can't be too clean. Sometimes it's a little, a little over the top. Um, one of the other sort of sets of epidemiological data supporting the hygiene hypothesis is shown here, which is that if you look at different individuals, um, and you look to see whether different individuals either have, uh, are healthy or have um, this bias towards the TH2 and somewhat more allergic and autoimmune responses. You can actually see that um, older kids um, are less likely to have allergies. Younger kids, or sorry, older kids are more, kids with older siblings uh, don't have the allergies. Only children tend to have allergies. Kids who go to daycare or kids who grow up on farms tend to uh, be OK, um, unlike others. And so you can imagine, for example, if you're the second kid, your parents aren't cleaning up after you the way that they cleaned up after that first kid. And so in fact, the microbes in your environment are probably going to be different. If you go to daycare, you're around all those other little icky children. Um, and so you might be getting different microbes. If you're, in, if you're growing up on a farm, um, you may see some differences. And so you sort of can imagine these sort of general differences that may bias one towards um, more or less um, immune uh, autoimmune responses. I've mentioned that there is this idea of a problem with the balance between Th1 and Th2 responses. That the reason why we see these hygiene hypothesis type responses is that your Th1s and Th2 should balance each other. You get rid of one, you throw the other one out of whack. Being part of why we're seeing this increase in allergy and autoimmune diseases. Um, this is another interpretation or another idea of what could be going on here. And so you can imagine that 
in a population of individuals, and I will tell you that um, the more I learn about this model, the more I, this model makes sense to me. Um, you have a population of individuals who have different strengths of their immune systems. So if this is like all the people in your country or in your population, you're going to have this bell curve. Some people are going to have kind of weak immune systems. Some people are going to have medium immune systems. Some people are going to have strong immune systems. Right? Make sense? If everybody in your country or many people in your area are infected with some different parasites, that's going to weaken their, your um, average immune responses. It's going to take everybody's immune responses and kind of shift them over to the left. Move everybody's immune responses a little bit weaker. Because everybody has to deal with these parasites that are immunosuppressing. And so you're not going to have very many people whose immune responses are super high. Because you kind of pushed everybody over the line. You pushed them all down. And so you just don't have many people with a high enough immune response to actually cause problems. Because you've kind of suppressed the immune response due to parasite infection. Alternatively, if we have a group of people who are in a parasite-free population, we still have that same bell-shaped curve. But now the bell-shaped curve is shifted over. We don't have that general suppression from the parasite-infested population. And you can see now way more people are going to be over the line into allergy because we haven't brought the population down. And you can also realize that throughout, if we think about sort of the history of human existence, humans mostly spent their time like this. This is kind of what our immune system evolved with. And now it's like, wait, what? I'm, I'm, I'm activated at what level? Excuse me? I'm way over here. Um, and so that can sort of be a little bit of an issue. We also know about one other specific example um, where we can understand how a particular set of genes as well as an environmental stimulus come together to actually lead to um, an uh, autoimmune and autoinflammatory disease. And so this is, there's this example that's Crohn's disease as well as this example that's been worked out really well in the past five years or so for celiac, um, which I will start us with on Monday. <laughs>